you will see a lot of code, a lot of benchmarks, and code in two different languages, in Scala and in JavaScript. Um, but yeah, I, I hope I'll be able to talk you through it. We'll, we'll actually look at generated codes at some point. So try not to read everything that's on the screen at all times. Uh, because there will be irrelevant parts that are just part of the generated thing. So try to focus on what I'm showing and try not to um, read everything. OK, so that said, um, I was asked to put this slides. Uh, apparently, none of the speakers uh, uh, except me did that. But if you did not read the previous session, please do. So that's about all the slides I have. <laughs> So, um, because we'll be switching between this Eclipse IDE, yes, I use Eclipse, this SBT console, and this Notepad++ editor with generated code for most of the session. So this talk is about the things that Scala.js does to make your code fast. So it's obviously about optimizations, right? Um, however, no worries. You don't have to be a compiler hacker. We'll, we'll, we'll show what it does, uh, the kinds of things it can do, thing, the kinds of things it cannot do, and, but we'll not explain how it does it. So let's start with our first example, which is a for loop, like a for i uh, from 0 until n, which is over here, vs, the good old while loop, uh, written Java style. I mean, it's it, not even Java style, because in Java you would use a for loop. But So it's, I don't know if you're familiar with performance in Scala JVM, it is pretty notorious that if you need performance, avoid, uh, avoid the for loop on, on a range at all costs because it's slow. Um, so we'll see what, what happens in Scala.js. Is it, is it also very slow, or is it not too slow, or maybe it's even worse? So let's see. Uh, so just, just to give you uh, an idea, I, I have written this myself, this very little micro-benchmarking framework. So don't trust the benchmarks. The benchmarks are wrong. Uh, they're just there to highlight the fact that there is a difference when we change things, not really how much of a difference there is, because that's probably not going to be uh, good. However, uh, I can guarantee you that all these optimizations I'm going to talk about, they have real impact in real uh, code, because we have developed them against uh, big benchmarks, like macro benchmarks. So full application benchmarks, and we, we saw a difference. But we're not going to look at macro benchmarks today. OK, so uh, that's, that's enough of an introduction. So let's run this code. So I have this uh, small here, a small script here, which uh, runs the benchmarks. So this is using Node.js 4.2.1, I think. And we see that it runs it two times. So this one here and this one here. So Scala.js has an optimizer, right? Uh, and we're going to talk about the optimizations it does. So obviously, we're going to compare what happens without an optimizer and with the optimizer. So here, that's without the optimizer. And that's pretty bad, right? So you can look. This, this is time spent executing the code. So you can see that a while loop is reasonable. It's 0 0.13, some unit of, of time. It's microsec uh, milliseconds for something. It doesn't really matter, because we're going looking at differences. Um, and for loop is 1.64, which is that much bigger. Right? It's, it's really slow. So with, with an optimizer, that's much more reasonable. The, the while loop got a little bit better. It's 0 0.09. And the full loop is 0 0.12, which is very close to the while loop, right? OK, but I told you not to trust the benchmarks. So what are we going to trust? Well, the generated codes, because we like that. 
So for this, this little code here, let's look at uh, the generated code. So here, first I'm looking at the, the non-optimized version, right? And uh, oh, let me put that in the top corner. So this is the, the, the ugly stuff I was talking about, right? So let's, let, let me just uh, find for you the nice things. So here you can find nice things, which is the direct compilation uh, in JavaScript of the while loop. And you can see that, well, yes, you get voice, you get a while loop, it's pretty obvious. Something that might not be pretty obvious is these binary or zero and dollar IMOL, but don't really worry about that. That's, uh, the, the important thing is, is this, this while loop here. So where is the, um, the for example? So the for example is somewhere really hidden uh, inside this thing. So let's find where that is. It's over here. And it has an apply method because that's, that's a lambda. I could not really optimize it away so because we cannot do that. And look at all these ugliness here. So first, apparently, we have a rich int and we have an until extension that creates somehow a range. It's calling some method of pre-def here, passing it to zero. And well, if you look at the code of that method, it just returns the same value. So apparently, it needs to call it. And uh, then we're calling for reach here with an ugly name. And we were passing an anonymous function in there. And that anonymous function is, is actually doing the, in, the inside of the for loop, right? But it's, it's even worse uh, because we have to box that R value. It's, it's actually an object, right? You, you, can, you can see it here. It's allocated. It creates an object, which is some int ref. It's basically a mutable box for an int inside. And uh, it's, it's accessing the field of that thing every time you, you try to update it and, and read it. So this is pretty bad, and we can understand pretty easily why this code is 10 times slower than the, the while loop, right? So now, if we look at the version with the optimizer, that's actually much better. Um, give me one second to find it, OK? So this is same as before. That's the while loop version, right? So it did not really change because there was not much to optimize uh, from there. But let's look at the other one, which is still an anonymous function. So that's yeah, in, in an anonymous class. But now we have a completely different thing. So we have a huge blob of code that's completely illegible here. Um, don't, don't, yeah, that's, uh, don't really worry about it. Uh, the important thing is here we have a good old while loop. So it, it's, it's still not completely optimal, which explains the difference. Uh, we have this var count here that is incremented here, but is otherwise completely unused. Uh, so it serves no purpose whatsoever. Um, so, but the optimizer could not get rid of it. Turns out there is the closure compiler can actually remove that, but uh, we're not using closure here. So, and there is still this, this complete, this complicated header here, which is checking that the bounds of the range are right and see the rest of blah. But that's, that's outside of the loop and, and it's only doing simple, simple stuff. So, what happened, right? Uh, we can see that we had code with a very ugly box of an int ref for R and calling things and calling a for each method and giving it an anonymous function and all of that became a while loop. So two explanations. Either the optimizer knows that this is range for each and magically does something about it or, or it doesn't and it's just smart enough in, in some other ways to, to get rid of it. The correct answer, of course, is the second one. It's, it's, smart, it's smart enough to, to remove all of, that, uh, all of that stuff. So it's going to inline for each, inline the closure inside, get rid of the box because now it's completely uh, visible in the same scope, remove some dead code, and, and eventually get, um, get to, this, to this form. OK, so that's one thing. So that was, that was a good result, right? We, we had something that, that 
we, we, we had a manual while loop that you don't want to write in Scala. You want to use the idiomatic for range, but you typically cannot use it because it's too slow if, if you want performance. But, but here you can because Scala.js optimizer is just, just going to, to remove it. So let, let's look at a, something bad now, right? Something that, that even the Scala.js optimizer cannot, cannot get rid of, and that's longs. So the previous example was using ints, right? But uh, here we're going to, to just, just use longs instead. So um, in, in Scala JVM, that's not a big deal, right? Int or long, I mean, any way it fits in a 64-bit register. So, uh, However, in JavaScript, you may know that there is no such thing as a 64-bit integer. So as a matter of fact, there is no such thing as a 32-bit integer either. <laughs> Um, there is only doubles in JavaScript. But it turns out that there is a pretty compact in, in encoding of signed 32-bit integers in JavaScript that virtual machines are very good at optimizing, actually better than the normal operations. However, for longs, that just does not exist. So how do you, what do you do about longs? Well, you implement them. Like, we really have library code implementing addition on longs. And that's not so good. So let's look at um, the benchmarks for this one. Let's call a CV, compile that, run. Uh, so here, for some reason, the for loop is, is faster than the while loop. It's probably an artifact. Um, but the important thing to note is, look at uh, the absolute numbers here. We had 0 0.12 and 0 0.09. The same code, just replacing ints by longs, it's now 18. And even with the optimizer, it's still 10 and 11 compared to 0 .9, uh, 0 0.09. So that's, that's how much slower? <laughs> that's a full 100 times slower. So longs are really bad. Don't use longs, um, except, except, of course, when you need them. But if, if you're in performance critical codes, uh, really, that, that's a bad thing to, to, to use. So the question now is, can we do better in the future? Well, sort of. I mean, we already did quite a lot. Uh, even though it's pretty bad, it was worse before. We optimized the longs quite heavily by hand with awful code that you don't want to read, even in Scala. Uh, so it's much better than before. It's, it's still still quite slow. So what we could, but, but there are things we can do in the future. Eventually, we'll get we'll get around to do to do them, but it's not going to happen anytime soon because I don't have an infinite amount of time, unfortunately. Okay. Let's look at a more fun example. That was sort of introductory. Because in Scala, you don't really use while loops. You don't, you, you don't really use for ranges either uh, most of the time. The thing that you do all the time is called map, right? Uh, who programs in Scala and does not use map at least once a day? Right, that, that's zero person, okay. Uh, but or maybe you're all asleep, so who programs in Scala and uses at least one, one map every day? Uh, okay, you're not asleep, good. So, uh, here I have three different versions of a map on an array. So the actual, I'm, I'm actually doing two maps in a row. Um, one with uh, just some computation, one with another computation over here. And I'm doing that in three different ways. The last way is just the manual thing that uses the while loop. That's for a baseline. That's what that that that's that's essentially what you get if if you optimize it by hand in a sense, right? So th this is this is our baseline. This is what we want to to achieve in a sense, but that's definitely not what we want to write as, as a code. So of course you see that uh, since I have two maps here, I have also in the manual version done two different while loops. One that performs the first map and one that performs the second, second map, right? 
And then I have two versions of actually calling map, but that are slightly different. Um, so let's look at the second one first. And this is, this is the, the one that you would expect. Uh, this, this is the Scala collections map. So even though I have an in here, probably the, yeah, that's probably too small for you to read. So it says that in is a, is a JavaScript array. So because with Scala.js, you can have JavaScript types and whatnot, but whatever, it's basically an array. Um, but if you, when we call map here, it's not calling the JavaScript map. Um, we, we have set up the types so that when we call map, we're actually calling this um, traversable-like dot map function, which takes a can build from, which creates a builder with a size hint, then calls a for each loop on this thing, calls the plus equal version. This, this, um, so th this for each call is basically megamorphic, or at least it's, it's definitely a polymorphic dispatch because there are many different traversable likes. So this is really bad. Um, and that's what you get on the Scala JVM most of the time. Um, the other one is, it looks the same, except that I have two casts that are a bit weird. I'm casting to a type called JS dynamic, and, and then I'm casting back to a JS array. I'm not going to enter into the details of why it does what it does. You'll just have to believe me that this forces Scala JS to call the map, the JavaScript map function on an, a JavaScript array. Because JavaScript has an, a native map on, on its native arrays. So you would expect that to be reasonably fast, right? Because it's, it's, it's native. So uh, let's see. Let, let's see if, if, it's, if it's fast. Scala C compiling. Good job. Okay, let's first look at the non-optimized version. So first thing first, um, the manual version is fast. Okay, that's good. The Scala collections map is, is bad, right? Because that's without optimizer. You have all these traversable legs for each plus equal. It's at least 10 different uh, indirections be be before you get to actually call the function that does the map and, and put elements in the array. So that's really bad. Uh, but, but let's look at the JS native map, native in quotes. It, it's still four times slower than the manual version, right? So, okay, well, it's, it's still faster than the, the, the Scala collections map, so it's not too bad, right? So obviously JavaScript is doing something right here. Um, but then let's look at what, what happens if we do have the optimizer. Oh. That's a different kind of, um, of, of picture, right? So here, um, the manual time basically remained the same. Uh, the Scala Collections map, however, whoops, it was completely optimized away. It's as fast as the manual version. Um, so that, that, that's pretty good. And the JavaScript native map, well, <laughs> It's still lagging behind. It's still four times slower than these two versions. So what happened? Well, remember, we don't trust the benchmarks. The only thing we really trust is generated code. So let's look at generated code and try to figure out where the main function arrived here. So that's, that's the double while that reasonable. Uh, we can also look at this guy. No, that's the Scala collection map. I don't want to see that one yet. I want to have a look at the JavaScript version. So the JavaScript version is pretty much what you would write by hand in JavaScript, right? Assuming you're a functional programmer and you use map and not, you know, a for loop every time. Uh, so you're basically calling map, which is a JavaScript function. You give it an anonymous JavaScript function as a parameter, and you do something, and then you call map again, and you do something else. So that's, I mean, that's what you would write by hand in JavaScript. So Scala.js did not make the JavaScript native map worse than it was, right? So I'm, it, we're not cheating here. Um, so 
What about the, the Scala Collections map version? Well, that one's really ugly. Uh, we're not going to go through it completely, but you can see that we're, we have some array ops, which is some implicit conversion on JavaScript arrays that uh, takes the in. Uh, it, you call, we call map here, and we give it a can build from, which is uh, this guy here, which is a can build from for JavaScript arrays. So you may not be familiar with can build from, or maybe you are, but it's a elaborate mechanism in the Scala collections library that allows map to return the same type of element. I mean, the same, the same type of collection. So it's going to return a map, even though there is only one, uh, a JS array, even though there is only one single implementation of map. And then in the middle, of course, you, you give it the actual anonymous function, which, uh, which does the, the, the inside of the work, okay? So um, that is, is definitely bad. Uh, we, we, we can make it better. Uh, we, we, can, we, we can actually go and look into the, this map function, uh, but I don't want to scare you too much. So we're not going to dive into those details. So instead, uh, we're going to just look quickly at uh, the generated code for the optimized version, which is uh, much, much nicer. Um, but this time we're going to go directly to the Scala Collections map version because the other two ones don't actually change much. And here we go. And that looks that like, that looks nice. Uh, it's basically a while loop, right? So let, let's look at a few key ingredients. We're creating first a JavaScript empty array for the, the result, the result array of the map. Uh, we're initializing something to, to one, we're fetching the length, then we have this while loop here. For every, uh, every iteration, we get the element which is here. We're actually performing here, this is, this is the, the actual content of, of the anonymous function that is given to map, it is, it's right there. And then we push directly to the destination array, that's good. And then we do basically the same thing, right? We, we create, for the second map, we, we have this, this, this thing. So basically everything disappeared. It's just the, the destination array. Uh, and then we loop with the while loop and we call the, the anonymous function, but it's actually been inlined also. So it's not really a call. It's just computation right there. And then we push in the destination array and it's, it's all gone, right? So that, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, we can see one thing it did not do well. Uh, we still have two while loops. And that's, I mean, we're just calling two maps in a row. Uh, ideally, a, a, ver a very smart optimizer could just fuse the two maps into one map and do just the, the, in, the inner computations. It would do it uh, inside one, one single map, one single while loop, right? Here we still have to to create this intermediate array in the middle. So that's something that ScalaJS does not do for you. It won't magically fuse um, successive operations on the collections. And it's probably something it will never do for non-obvious reasons, unless we rewrite the collections library in a way that is uh, more fusible for some definition of fusible. Okay. So that was for map, which is good because as we saw, it's something that we do like every day and uh, it's, it's basically as fast as the manual version so it can, can hardly get better. Okay, so now for something quite different. We're going to look at traits. So I have a trait foo which has a concrete method, bar. And then I have a bunch of classes, seven of them, I think, that all extends foo. So on the JVM and on JavaScript, you might know or not that this the Scala compiler is actually going to create a method which is called bar in every single one of those classes. 
So in, in the generated bytecode and the generated JavaScript, you will have a.bar, which basically is a, a bridge to calling foo.bar, which is a static method at that point, and then the same in all those classes. With Scala 2.12, it's a bit different. Uh, it uses default methods of Java 8 as much as possible um, on, on, on the JVM. On Scala.js, it basically does still the same thing uh, in a different way, but it's basically the same thing. So that's good, right? Because you get concrete methods and traits, and I think we all love concrete methods and traits. So, but in terms of performance, that's not really ideal. So why? Well, if I have this all thing, which is an array of, of all these things, and I'm basically creating a big random array of, of a mix, a random mix of these uh, A, B, C's, and, and G's instances. And the only thing I'm doing with those is basically calling the bar method. Everything else is just for the purpose of the benchmark. But I'm basically calling the bar method. And I mean, there's only one bar method, right? It's, it's this one. But in fact, there isn't. There, there's a bunch of them. And, and, mil and there, you, you're going to have a virtual dispatch basically on all these bridges. So is it, is it really bad? I mean, J JITs, the JVM, the JavaScript JITs, they're pretty good, right? So they, they, should, they should be good at dealing with this stuff. And, and indeed, in a sense, they are, right? If, if we restrict our randomness to always return zero and hence always return an A, um, what thing I forgot to do is, of course, change this guy here. So here we're only going to look at, um, at the non-optimized version first. So this is a bit longer running benchmark. Um, yeah, it was faster. OK, um, so, so that, um, that's good. It's 390. Uh, it's, pr it's pretty good. And basically, uh, I'm jumping ahead, but the baseline is what the optimizer does, which is 3.5. So that, that's, that's pretty reasonable. Um, so remember 390. We're just going to now, so to change this one into a two. And now in this bigger way, we've, we have A's and we have B's in a completely random pattern, right? So remember this 390? Well, it's going to not be 390 anymore. Now you can already see 10s, 8s, 9s. So that's 9.12. That's three times as slow because we basically ch change between always calling a.bar to calling either a.bar or b.bar. And the JITs behind, the JavaScript JITs behind Scala.js is not very good at this. It, it, it has now a choice between calling a.bar and b.bar. It has to check which one is the correct one before it can call it. But this is kind of stupid because both of these things, then they then call the same method, which is essentially foo.bar, right? So that, that's, that's bad. But let's make it worse. Um, let's include all seven possible variations. And uh, now we can actually start waiting for the results of the benchmarks. Because it's, yeah, that's 30 for you. Uh, which is about three times as slow as before. So that we have some, some average around, around 30. But the one with the optimizer, with the ScalaJS optimizer, is still, still 3.43 as it's been like since the beginning, right? So this is, um, now we, we have a complete, uh, a complete 10, 10x difference between with and without the optimizer. And the reason it's slower without the optimizer is, as I explained, that JavaScript VM is not good at this game. It, it suddenly has in front of it a, a multiple dispatch between seven different variations. That's a megamorphic call. And, and it cannot inline anything. It's going to, to go into um, looking prototype chains and stuff, and it's really slow and it's really bad. However, uh, the, the version that is optimized 
is, has basically stayed, stayed the same across all variations of, of monomorphic, biomorphic, megamorphic. So how can that be? Basically, what, what, what is the optimizer doing here that, that prevents this, this huge degradation due to the megamorphic call on traits? Well, let's look at the code. Because I love looking at the code. Um, so let's see, we, we create an instance of each of those things, right? And then we have the code of the benchmark. And of course, we're calling here the bar method. It has a funny name as, as always, but it's basically calling the bar method in a while loop. So it, it's reasonable. Um, the problem is, what bar method? Well, maybe a.bar or b.bar or c.bar or d.bar. But all of these, uh, if, you've, if you're super attentive, you can see the D here, which changes. But otherwise, this, this content here is exactly the same in all those variations. And all of them, they call this function here. Uh, yeah. Here is its definition, which is basically the content of, of, this, uh, of this method, right? So with the optimizer, what changes? Well try to figure it out. Um, we still have, let's see, no, there's no main V, it's optimized away, main, test multi inline, okay, there you are. Okay, so what changed? So here, directly in the while loop, we have this uh, giant name, which is a direct call to, uh, to this method, which is exactly the same as before. It's, the, it's foo, it's foo.bar, it's, it's, it's implementation. And we've completely bypassed this, uh, this bridges, right? So remember we had a.bar, b.bar, and so g.bar, and all of that is gone. Actually, if we, if we look, if we even look in the entire file, we cannot find a.bar anymore. It's just, just gone. And the reason it can do this is what I call, um, well, you probably guessed it from the name of this method here, it's called what I call multi-inlining. Uh, that's a very Scala-specific optimization, specifically designed for these concrete methods and traits, that if you're in front of a polymorphic call, like you're calling one of these bar methods, but you don't know which one, but you can actually see that they're all doing the same thing. Well, it doesn't really matter which one you're going to call in the end, right? So you can just pick one and inline it and completely disregard all of the other variations. And that's basically what the ScalarJS optimizer is, is doing here. And that's a very important uh, optimization for, for typical Scala code because it, it com most concrete methods in traits are actually never overridden, right? So if you, if you do override the methods in, in one or more of these classes, then it doesn't work anymore because then, of course, a.bar is not going to do the same thing as b.bar. And so, well, you cannot just pick one in, in line. So that, that would be really wrong. Okay. So let's, let's just do a, a show of hands here. here who is still with me? <laughs> oh, that's, that's more than I expected. Good. Okay, well, I, I still have a um, couple examples. We're probably going to go a little bit faster on these ones uh, now that you've got the, the rhythm of, of things we're doing. So a very, 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 very important optimization is closure elimination. So it, it goes back to the map. Why is map slow if you don't optimize it? Well, because you're ca calling a map function you're giving it a closure, a, a lambda, right? an anonymous function, and map is going to call that lambda. The problem is you, you're calling map from many different places in your code with many different lambdas. And that means the call to the lambda inside the map is basically megamorphic and slow. So we, we're very, the optimizer tries very hard to inline map inside your code so that it can inline the lambda also inside the inline version of map to remove that 
thing, to remove that closure completely. So here we're going to look at just closure elimination, the, the basic variant without map and all the can build from, so we can actually have a closer look at what it, what, what it does really. So I have this custom made loop. So that, that's also to show that it's not because it's map, right? I mean, this, the optimizer doesn't know about the collections map function. It's not special in any way. It's not even annotated with at inline. Uh, it just has heuristics to inline it. Um, so it, it works for you, your functions too. So here I have a loop method which takes a function. Its implementation is stupid. It's just a while loop that calls the function, right? I have another version which I've called loop abort for reasons that will become clearer later, which is even stupider because uh, that one does the same thing but in two steps. It first does one while loop until the middle of it and then does a second while loop until the end. So that's kind of stupid. Uh, the, the key difference between those two things is that it's calling f lexically twice, right? You see that? I mean, we, we, have, we have two different textual calls to, to, the, to the lambda f, and that, that will change things. So here we're just going to look at the optimized version. I'm, I'm not really interested in the non-optimized version anyway. Uh, that's the, all the old benchmarks. I forgot to change that guy. Again. Compiling. We love Scala. OK, that's bad. So this is without the optimizer. We don't really look at it. OK, so with the optimizer, we have um, so what we see here is the first version, the f the, so we have two basically, um, no, sorry, that's not the code I want to show. So these are the, the, the loop methods, but the actual code we've benchmarking is basically calling loop twice, um, twice, well, specifically to, to prevent, well, uh, whatever, degradation. Uh, and here we're just doing exactly the same thing, but we're calling loop abort, which does the same thing, right? Uh, but with optimizer, the, the first one, which is not uh, loop abort, is significantly faster uh, than, than the one where it's aborted for some reason, for some definition of aborted. So let's look at the code to see what's the, what's the difference, but we're going directly to the optimized version. Okay, test closure, Alain. Where are you? Here. So... This is the one with, um, uh, wait, I lost myself. Um, okay, this is one guy. So this is the one with loop abort, which is what you would, in a sense, expect. Uh, it did not do anything special. It's just calling loop abort as expected, it's giving it an anonymous function that does whatever it's supposed to do, and then it's calling again loop abort with another anonymous function. Right? So uh, we're interested in seeing what, uh, oops, so going back here and looking at the version two, which is the one with the loop, which is not aborted for Again, some definition of aborted. And here we have something which is unexpectedly good, uh, which is we basically have two while loops. So one for each call to loop, right? So here, in, in this case, this is the case where the optimizer did, its good, did, did a good job. It, it's, it completely inlined the call to loop. It inlined the lambda. It's all gone. But in the other case, it did not. And the only difference was really that loop abort had this funny thing of, of doing two different Y loops and calling twice F. So here I'm, I'm talking a little bit about the, the heuristics that the Scala.js optimizer uses to decide whether to inline and optimize things or whether not to. And one key, um, one, one key heuristics is if you call a method which is big, don't inline it. 
But an, an even more important heuristic is if you're calling a method, but one of the parameters is a lambda, please try very hard to inline it anyway, even if it's big. So here, loop is big, but we're calling it at this point here with an anonymous function. And that's, that's a very strong incentive for the scalar JS optimizer to try very hard to inline loop precisely because it's trying to get rid of this, this map problem, right? That the problem that you're calling a method from various different places and from each of these places you're giving a different lambda. So here it's, it's going to inline loop and then try to, in, to inline the closure inside the loop. And it works, it works. But then the question is, is why doesn't it do the same thing for loop aborts? Because it's the same thing, right? Loop aborts is a big function, but we're giving it a closure, uh, a lambda, so it should try to inline it, right? And it doesn't, apparently. Well, it actually did try. It did try, but then it, it, came, it came in front of, of a problem here, because it saw the call to F, which is good. It's, it, it inlines the lambda inside that call, but then later, it does the same thing. So it, it calls f again. And that's a problem, because now you have to inline the closure a second time if you code. And that means you're duplicating the body of your lambda. And it might not be a problem all the time, but you know it's heuristics. And one of the, the heuristics is if you have to inline a lambda twice, just bail out, it's not worth it. So it's going to go back in time, revert the decision it made to inline loop, loop abort because it was giving a lambda. It, it's just, it just doesn't, it's not worth it anymore because it's not going to be able to get rid of the lambda, it's, it's, it has to duplicate it. So that, that's not good. And so it, it completely, um, completely aborts all these optimization. And that's finally the explanation for this loop abort name. So I have a few minutes left. So yeah, the, the key thing to remember here is if you want your methods, your higher order method to be in lines, don't call the lambda twice. Uh, or, or, you know, um, I mean, if you have to, you have to, but try not to. So I think I'll skip over that one. Um, it's it's color replacement, AKA stack allocation. Uh, bottom line is tuples, if they're local to a method, they disappear, uh, just become two different variables. But it, I, w I ex kind of expected I would not have the time to look at this one, and indeed I don't. So I look at one last example, which is, again, a bad example. It, it's one example where the Scala JS optimizer does not do a, a good enough job quite yet. And it's pattern matching, which is a bummer, right? We, we love pattern matching. So this benchmark here is, is uh, comparing three different uh, versions of, of doing a different thing depending on, on which class of, of, of an ADT and which case class you have. So the obvious way is this pattern match here. Right? I'm, I'm pattern matching in against all my A, B, C, D, E, and I'm doing different things uh, based on, on whatever. The other version is the good old object-oriented version, which is I have an abstract method, uh, which is called methods, in parents, and I implement, it, uh, I implement it differently in all the subclasses. Okay. And then I have the third version, which is what you find typically in JavaScript style pattern matching, is that you have a special tag, a type field on your object, which is a number uh, representing which class you have. And so A is one, B is two, etc. And then you basically switch on this on this tag, and, and then it's like a pattern matching, but, but not quite, right? And then we, of course, we have to cast and it's ugly because, you know, you know. but in JavaScript they don't have cast, so they don't notice it's ugly. So, um, of course, I, I forgot again to update this. 
Nope. Not that one. This one. Okay. Compiling. Oh, that's done. It's reasonably fast. Okay. So let's look at without the optimizer for a brief, uh, brief couple of seconds. So the pattern matching is obviously the worst. It's five something. The object oriented way is apparently the fastest, and the manual switch is is okay. And uh, but with the optimizer, which is is eventually what what matters, what we see is the pattern match is still bad uh, because well. It's a bit faster, but it's, it's essentially bad. The object-oriented ver version did not really change. Um, it's, it's about the same. But the manual switch, for some reason, uh, got better. That's, that's because we, we inline the accessors and stuff. So bottom line is, the manual switch is eventually what wins. Uh, and the, the pattern match is, is not that good. I mean, it's not quite as bad as, uh, you know, longs, right? That, that was 100 times lower. Uh, but here it, it's only, you know, three times slower, maybe. The problem is also it doesn't scale. The, the, more, the more classes you have in your, in your uh, subclass of your abstract class, the, 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 the worse the pattern match gets, uh, whereas the switch uh, basically remains the same. So it, it does not scale. So that's something that doesn't work quite well yet. And we definitely plan to uh, improve on that one. So we're, we're trying to improve the optimizer so that it basically transforms a pattern matching that you wrote into a switch that you don't have to write, but that is fast. That's essentially what we do like all the time. We take the code that you write, and which is bad, and we make it bad. That's the whole purpose of, of an optimizer. So on that note, um, that's the, the end of uh, my talk, uh, right on time. And I'm happy to take a few questions. Um, thank you. <laughs> yep. Uh, how do you decide when to uh, compile to an optimized version of map? Do you look at the that type parameters uh, value or the can build from expression or something else? So it is the same heuristic that powers the loop vs loop abort example. So when you call map, one of the argument is a lambda, and that is a great incentive for ScalaJS to inline map. And then it inlines the, the lambda within. Then the can build from and all these stuff is all sorts of stuff that basically get inlined and then that, that code eliminates away because they're small. So a can build from is, is typically five th different indirections, but that are all one-liners. So they're small, they're getting lines, and eventually uh, everything's happy. And, and it, it basically knows everything at this point uh, statically, and so it, it inlines and then removes. So that, that's how it works. But the, the core heuristic is the same as the loop vs yes, loop abort, which is you're giving it a lambda, it inlines it as much as possible. Other question? Yeah, there. So uh, with your pattern matching, how do you how do you do more complicated things? You know, with like guards and stuff like that. Can you still get it down to a switch, or do you do you have to? sort of try and do something like enclosure script? I am not familiar with what closure script does in this regard. Um, so right now, basically, we don't really do anything special about pattern matching. So what happens is Scala C compiles its pattern matching into a bunch of is instance offs and then adds checks, uh, additional ifs for guards and that kind of stuff. Um, what we do plan to, to optimize is the straightforward if, else, if, else, if, else, if of is instance of. So if you have a guard in the middle, it will not be as, uh, as good. I mean, it, eventually, eventually it, it will be good enough. Uh, but, but of course, guards in the middle are always a, a problem. It, it, yeah. Um, so... But, but it's, 
it doesn't really matter because the, the, first, the first branching is, is, is the big problem. And that one, Scala C gives us something that at the top level basically is an if else if else if of is instance stuff, and then inside you have ifs. And so the, the um, for the guards. And so it's a, the, the top level if else if else if, we can translate it to a switch eventually. And then inside the cases of the switch, well, you have, you have the ifs for the guards. Over here. Um, okay. Just out of curiosity, can you explain why the generated JavaScript code has so many or zeros <laughs> all over the place? That's uh, signed inter integer 32-bit for you. Uh, so this is the encoding to, to encode properly the, the, cement, the wrapping semantics of 32-bit signed integers. It turns out that this code is faster than without the binary or zeros. Uh, it's because insert faster than doubles, and the VMs recognize these patterns as, as what they are, which is the encoding of signed 32-bit integer arithmetic. So that's why all the R zeros. With, with all the generated code, uh, what happens you know, when it all needs to transfer over network in, you know, if it's on a website? Um, so here we, we've looked at generated code, but in its nice, readable version, um, which, is, which is pretty printed. And yes, the names are, are really long and, and kind of obscure the first time you read them. For me, it, it becomes a bit more obvious. Uh, um, of course, that's not what you ship. Uh, before you actually ship to, uh, to, to the browsers of your clients in production, you actu we actually apply an additional pass, which, we, which is powered by the Clojure compiler, which uh, very, uh, very actively minifies the codes and uh, performs some, some JavaScript-specific minimization and optimization. So in the end, a, a typical application weighs a couple of hundreds of kilobytes, uh, non-gzipped. Then you can then typically it's gzips in addition. If you have a very large, very large code bases, uh, I know that people have uh, non gzipped but minified JavaScript files of a couple megabytes. But those are, I mean, if you look at Gmail, that's also uh, it's also a couple megabytes. So the the big big code bases tend to be a couple megabytes. Typical applications tend to be a couple of, of hundred kilobytes. Uh, there was one question in the middle first. Uh, which one would be faster, um, a Scala native application or a Scala JS application on, on V8? <laughs> the Scala native application is probably going to be much faster. Um, at the front here. How do you find targets for optimization? Uh, so how do you decide what you're going to optimize next? Whatever is the bottleneck of our next benchmark. <laughs> uh, but since we use basically the, the Octane benchmarks, uh, which are the, the V8 um, JavaScript benchmarks, that's, that's what we progressively port, and that's what drives the, um, what we figure out is, is a bottleneck in, in, the, in the current encoding and what we optimize for. But it doesn't always work. For example, pattern matching is, is definitely not something you'll get from Octane Benchmarks. So, but those are, are things that we know from Scala are bad. So we will also try to optimize for these kind of things. OK, I think uh, that's all. And uh, that's good, because we're a bit over time. Uh, so thank you again, and I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>